kids that are going to camp, please uh, see Sarah Prine about that. Uh, the applications for those need to be in by the 30th of May, so she'll help you with the paperwork and all of that kind of stuff, so please see her. Also, if you're interested in being a part of the prayer chain, either texting or email, you need to see Misty Potts, and uh, she'll get you connected with that. Starting June the 6th, um, Kids Church will be uh, from noon to 2 every Sunday. The bus will be running for that. We'll have uh, game time together, we'll uh, eat lunch together, and then uh, we'll have separate kind of classes for the different age group kids. Um, so uh, we would encourage you, if you've got kids, grandkids, neighbors, uh, you want to get them to be a part of that, we would love to have you join us. We are looking for some folks that maybe would help uh, make a meal throughout the summer. Um, not every week, but if you want to sign up for one of those, that'd be wonderful if you'd see Sarah or Jen uh, for that. And then uh, our regular schedule this week uh, for online stuff and uh, normal service. So uh, we also have a very special young lady today. Her name is Ivy. Uh, Miss Ivy, can you stand up and wave? That's Miss Ivy over in the corner. <laughs> today is her birthday. She is officially four. So She's being shy. She was not that shy earlier when she got into the chocolate basket. So uh, she was, she was 
very happy about that. But uh, are there any other announcements this morning that need to be made? Yeah, Rusty. Um, I don't know if it's an announcement or not, but uh, Diane and I started coming to this church in 2009. And almost every Sunday that we've been in this church, church started with a bright smiling face of Mr. Jeff Dean. And it was always an uplifting, he always had a great attitude, and he's decided to, to give that up. And I would just like to show my appreciation to the years that, that he has opened church for us and let us in open in prayer. I, I thought he done a fantastic job. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Anybody else? All right, if not, um, Lori has her prelude. Thank this morning to be in your house and for the privilege of that. Uh, we thank this morning of the many requests that are on different hearts. We ask, Father, that you would meet each of those. It's so good to be able to come in here and to worship you freely. Uh, Father, I pray today that as uh, we enjoy the sunshine and the, the beautiful weather, that you would remind us of those who, uh, who are not able to do that. Father, I ask today that as we worship you and continue on in worshiping you, that it would be done in spirit and in truth, and that you alone would receive the glory and the praise. Father, we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our worship portion. I will apologize in advance. Our projector is not working, so you'll be looking at our backsides today. So <laughs> you'd stand with us for worship, please. <laughs>
the last several weeks, we've been talking about the uh, persecuted church. Uh, Open Doors is another opportunity that we have to support those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who don't have the freedom to worship openly. And uh, Open Doors was started by Brother Andrew. He was a Bible smuggler. Um, and uh, if you want to, uh, to get his story, you can go to Open Doors USA um, online and they will connect you with that. You can get his story. You can also find ways that you can support them, whether that is by donating Bibles um, or relief or aid or those kind of things. Uh, they are in, uh, in dozens of closed countries and, uh, and help Christians all around the world who are being marginalized right now because they have chosen to follow Jesus Christ. And uh, I don't know about you, I can't imagine that. Um, being told that simply because you're a Christian, you can't do this, or you can't do that, but it's happening all over the world. Um, and, uh, and we have a responsibility to care for our brothers and sisters. The scriptures tell us that. So a couple of updates um, as well as we care for our brothers and sisters here. Uh, we've been praying for Vince and for little Josh that were involved in a motorcycle crash. Uh, Vince is doing well. Uh, he had surgery this week to uh, fit him for a prosthetic. They were able to remove his trach and had him up walking. Um, so thankful for that. We're going to continue to pray that God would continue to heal him. Uh, Josh is doing well as well. Uh, and then if you are on the prayer chain, you saw this week that John would be Linda and PJ Johnson's son-in-law was involved in a very serious car accident. Uh, at Fort Amanda in 501, and uh, they flew him to Toledo. He is doing better. Um, Linda said this morning that the air that was trapped within the chest cavity has been gone now. Uh, he was able to eat a little bit of jello. Um, he is in a halo. He's got some fractures in his neck and back, um, but he is doing well. So we're thankful for that. We're continuing to praise God for that because initially things did not look good at all. So we want to remember him. And, uh, and Kate and the kids and Linda and PJ and the family. So uh, there are some other requests, some unspoken requests. We want to continue to remember them. We uh, want to continue to remember Heidi as she recovers and, uh, and goes through her treatment process as well as Renee. Uh, so let's just take a moment together to pray and, uh, and take our, our request before the Lord. The Bible tells us that we can bring our burdens before him. So let's, let's just take a minute to do that. Father, we come before you today and, and your word is very clear that your, your desire is that we would cast our cares on you, that we would, we would throw them to you and, and not take them back. Father, that's so hard. And yet this morning we take just a moment to do that. Father, we pray today for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are struggling, who are being persecuted for your namesake, who are, who are being mistreated because they have chosen to be Jesus followers. God, I pray right now that you would protect them. I pray that you would thwart the plans of those that seek to do them harm. Father, I pray today that you would be with the requests that have been mentioned. We're thankful for the progress that Vince has made and that John has made this week. We pray, Father, that you would continue to, to guide and direct, give the doctors wisdom. Father, we're thankful that Austin came through his surgery well and that Phyllis was able to get out of the hospital and, and, and is in rehab. Father, we, we ask that you would continue to be with them. Continue to be with Heidi and Renee, Father, and give them strength. Father, be with their families and encourage them. Lord, we know that there are unspoken requests. There are some that have walked in here today and they, and they feel... They feel like a crushing weight. You promise us that your burden is light. And so, Father, we, we trade you. We give you those things that are heavy on our hearts today and those things that weigh us down and occupy our minds and, and we take them and we lay them at your feet. Father, knowing that you know best regardless. So, Lord, give us wisdom. Give us direction, give us insight and clarity to follow you. Father, we do continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for our brothers and sisters that are there in the Middle East, in the midst of this conflict. Father, we support Israel, and so we ask for the peace of Jerusalem as your word commands us. 
But Father, we pray for the innocents on both sides that are being affected because of this. God, I ask today that as we study your word, you would make us students of it. You would make us mindful of the hope that comes from you. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Today we're going to uh, be continuing on in our series, The Answer Is. And uh, we've talked about everything in love. God's word is absolute. Last week we talked about grace with the woman at the well. And today I want to talk about hope. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. While you're turning there, uh, I want to tell you, um, I unequivocally and without reservation stand with the nation of Israel in the midst of this conflict. I think that it is shameful that as a nation we have not come out in uh, defiance of those that have sought to do Israel harm simply because they have existed. And uh, the, those that would seek to destroy a nation simply because of who they are as a people, I think that is reprehensible. And, uh, and I would encourage you to make that known, if that's where you stand as well. The Bible is very clear that the, the Jewish people are God's chosen people. I believe that he put them back in Israel uh, under the definition of prophecy of Scripture. And, and so I made that decision as, as a Christian, as an American. I'm, I'm a proud American, but I am someone who stands boldly with Israel. And uh, if that is where you stand, I would encourage you to make that known as well. Um, call right. There's great opportunities if you're looking for a place to support Jewish people who are being affected by this conflict. The Joshua Fund is a wonderful place. It's by a gentleman by the name of Joel Rosenberg. Um, he is a phenomenally intelligent human being. Uh, I would encourage you to check him out and to keep up to date on what's going on in the Middle East. I want to talk today about hope. Luke chapter 14, uh, it, it's known as the parable of the great banquet. Uh, I'm going to have you run my slides more if you would, Jen, because I can't see them. Uh, we're going to start at verse 16, and we'll go down through uh, verse 20, just there on our first slide. And, and I want to read to you what is taking place. Let me set the background real quick. Jesus is invited to the Pharisees' house. Now, the Pharisees are the religious leaders. This is like, uh, this would be like your pastor's conference, right? These are the guys that get together. They're all the guys that are supposed to have the answers and do things right, and yada, yada, yada. And Jesus is invited to their home. And it's a Sabbath. And while he's sitting there in their midst, he looks across and he sees a man who is struggling. The Bible says that he has a disease that has caused great swelling. If you've ever had something that, that you know, you've hurt your hand or, or your foot or your leg uh, and it swells, you know that that's painful. And Jesus sees this guy is in trouble and he asks the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Because for them that would be considered work and they say we should work on the Sabbath. So they don't agree with that. Well, when Jesus asks the question, they all sit there dumbfounded. They don't want to say the right thing, say the wrong thing. And so Jesus just reaches over and he heals this guy. And now all of the Pharisees are mad. They're mad because Jesus not only has worked on the Sabbath, which has broken their law, but he has also shown them up because he's taking care of a guest in someone else's home. And they're ticked about this. And so to kind of break that silence, you know, have you ever been at a family dinner where there's the awkward silence, where somebody says something and all of a sudden everybody's just like, what do we say now? You know, politics or religion comes up or, you know, somebody says they're a Michigan fan and you're like, you know, you're, you're just so upset by that. That's kind of what's going on in this moment. Not to pick on Michigan fans. We love you, but it doesn't happen in our family. In the midst of all of this, there's this quietness. And one of the guys at the table tries to do something that we have probably all done. They try and say something that's going to make the whole situation okay. I call these like casket clauses. You know what I mean by when I say a casket clause? Have you ever, have you ever had that time where you've gone to the funeral home and you're walking by the casket and you want to say something to make it okay. And so you don't really know what to say. What does everybody say about that person? What do they say? They look, nice. they look so nice. Don't they look nice? 
Oh, they look so pretty. I've left strong instructions with Tom Bailiff. I want to look terrible. I want to look horrible. I don't want anybody to be able to say, oh, he looks so nice. I want people to be like, whoa, what's up with him? I don't want whatever he had. <laughs> we try and say things that, that smooth over those uncomfortable moments. We are people who are constantly trying to do that. We're constantly trying to come up with the right phrase, the right verse, the right thing to say that if I say this, it's going to fix it all. Can I tell you something? If you've ever been on the other side of that, you know that what people say to you in that moment really doesn't have a huge impact. What matters is that they were there. And, and we try so hard to say the right things. And here's this guy sitting at this dinner table and it's gone quiet. And this guy's just been healed. And Jesus is there. And, and he tries to say one of those phrases that's going to make everything make sense. In verse 15 he says, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Out of nowhere. He just, hallelujah, we're going to eat together in the kingdom. And everybody kind of just stops and looks at him. And Jesus wanted to never waste an opportunity to share the truth. Immediately begins to tell a story. Verse 16 is where we'll pick up. It says, Jesus replied, a man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on the way to try them out. Please excuse me. And still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. So here we have this man who has prepared this great feast. This feast, has, it's a banquet. It's an exciting time. The Pharisees would be eating this up because they're all about networking. You see, the Pharisees love to be invited to each other's houses. They love to, to try and show off what they have. They, they love to have those, those opportunities to say, this is better, mine's better than yours, or yours, you know, yours isn't as good as mine. And so this guy's having this great feast, and he invites all of these people. And they all originally say, hey, I would love to go. But then the time rolls around where the banquet is ready and the excuses start to come out. Have you ever had a time in your life where you committed to something and at the time it seemed like such a great idea and then when it actually came time to be in the middle of it, you're like, oh, I wish I hadn't done this. When I was uh, about eight years old, we went to church camp and we went to Camp Piedmont was the name of the church camp at the time. Now, I love church camp. I'm a huge proponent of church camp, went to church camp all my life. But Camp Piedmont will stick out in my mind forever. Because a nasty flu bug came to Camp Piedmont with us. And out of the about 300 of us campers that were there, about 200 of us got sick. And, and I'll never forget... You know, the, the look on the face of the camp nurse. This lady who had volunteered, I, I literally think she worked as a dermatologist in a dermatology office. I don't think she, I think that's what she did. And I'll never forget the look on her face as she was walking through the dining hall as we're all just sitting there like, Ugh, praying for death. We don't want anything to do with the camp food. And she's just passing out little cups of Pepto-Bismol as she's walking through. And, and I think back to that now. In fact, to this day, um, friends of mine that I have seen years later, we still refu refer to that as Camp Pukemont, not <laughs> Piedmont. And I think back to that and I think, oh, I'll bet that camp nurse thought, what was I thinking? I have 300 little kid campers who are sick, away from home, miss their mom, sick tummies, I'm cleaning up after them all the time. I should have just written a check to a missions agency or said, yes, Lord, I'll go to Africa because this is awful. I wonder 
if there are times in our lives where we commit to things and we say, you know, I want to do this or I want to do that or I, I feel led to do this. And in the midst of that, our hearts are in it. But when it comes time to actually fulfill that, we come up with reasons why I don't really want to do that. It's not really my thing. It's not my style. It's not what I want to do. I don't really enjoy that anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to get started in that. It may take me too much time. It may cost me too much. Here we have this party that this great person, this, this great man was preparing, this banquet, and everybody initially says, yes, I want in. And then when it comes time to go to the party, they say, oh, I'm busy. The first one, he says, that they all alike began to make excuse, excuses. The first one says, I bought a field and I've got to go check it out. Have you ever seen a field run away? Have you ever been driving down the road and thought, there used to be a field there. I wonder where that field moved to. I swear I had 80 acres of corn, right? Right? It must have walked off. I had someone tell me uh, a couple of years ago that concrete walks. And I, and I said, I'm sorry, what? And we're looking down this line and there's these concrete posts, and there's like 10 of them, and they're all in a straight line. He said, well, they all walked about eight feet. And I said, walking concrete? I didn't know that was a thing. Thank goodness we didn't make the porch out of that. Who knows where it would be? I don't want to get a call from town. And Chief Miller's like, Andrew, your porch is walking downtown. I need you to come get it. And he said, yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? And I said, well, <laughs> you said it, not me. This guy says, hey, I bought a field. I, I got to go check it out. I mean, this field, who knows what's in it now? I mean, it could have moved. It could have, come on. He doesn't want to go. The second one says, oh, I bought some oxen. I need to, I need to see if they pull. I need to see if they, they work together. And, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please, excuse me. Would you buy an oxen that you didn't know whether or not it would pull? Before you laid your money down, would you say, hey, I think I want to buy these, or would you say, yeah, that team, I have seen them work, I know what they're doing, have at it. He doesn't want to go. The third guy here is the only one that really makes sense, and he says, well, I just got married, and I'm not allowed to come out and play. Now, for all of the husbands, you know that was a legitimate excuse. Uh, I remember when I first started here, uh, I had my pastor's book. When, when I first became a pastor, my grandfather bought me this book, Order, order of Service book. And then it, it, it has, you know, everything that you need to do from baptisms to, to burials. And, uh, and I remember I had my first funeral and I'm, I've got my little Order of Service book in my Bible and I'm standing back there and Tom Bailiff and I are in the back and, and I said, look, Tom, I said, weddings are right next to funerals. And he said, you know why that is, right? And I said, why? He said, because they're both the end of a good life. <laughs> now Tom said it, not me. And I certainly didn't laugh at it. I, I would never. This guy says, hey, I got married. I, I'm not allowed to come. I'm sorry. That's an excuse. It's an excuse. It, it may sound more logical than the other two, but it's still an excuse. You know, there are times in our lives where God calls us to reach out to people who are hurting, to reach out to people who are struggling, to reach out to people who are going through difficult times, or just to reach out maybe to our neighbors or our friends, and all of a sudden we come up with all kinds of excuses, don't we? Can I tell you some of the excuses I come up with? It's going to be uncomfortable. If I have to have a conversation with somebody about their eternity, it's going to be uncomfortable. If I have a conversation with them about the fact that I follow Jesus, they may think I'm crazy. If I have a conversation with somebody about the fact that they need to know Jesus personally and that that matters to me, they may think I'm overstepping. If I pray before my meal in the break room, they may think I'm all of a sudden this crazy religious guy or down. If I tell my friends that I'm not going to do those things because I have a relationship with Jesus, 
They may think I'm boring and no fun. Oh, the excuses are different. None of us would say, well, I, gotta buy a f I bought a field and I got to go make sure it didn't run off. Or I bought oxen and, and it, I got to go see if they pull. Or I got married so I can't come. None of us would say that, but I have used other excuses. Some excuses even make good sense. There was a time that, uh, it's been many years ago, I was at St. Rita's. And I was coming down the elevator, and as I, I was up visiting somebody on 8, they were in for observation, and as I'm coming down the elevator, somebody gets on at 4. Now, at 4, at St. Rita's, there's the ICU and CCU and the, the uh, neuro unit, and this woman gets on. She's probably in her 50s, and as the door shut, she just begins to sob. I'm a young preacher. I'm supposed to have all the answers, right? I went to Bible college. I read the Bible. I'm supposed to have, I'm supposed to be the guy from Little House on the Prairie that stands back and says, thus saith the Lord, this is what you need to do. That's what my mind. And I got nothing. I got nothing. She is sobbing. We get downstairs to the first floor. I still haven't said anything yet. She walks out of the elevator, makes a left to go out the doors. I still haven't said anything yet. In my mind, I can tell you exactly the conversation that I'm having. She's got enough going on. She doesn't need me interrupted. She doesn't want me to intrude. She doesn't want any... It's... No, I'm, I'm not gonna. She gets outside of the parking lot. And I'm, I'm right behind her because we're going to the same place. And she is still sobbing. She gets to her car, and I'm getting ready to walk past, and, and I don't know that it was physical or spiritual or both, but it was like I ran into a brick wall. Like, literally, I couldn't move. And God said, pray with her. And I came up with all kinds of excuses. Lord, I just bought a field. I bought some oxen. I'm married. Um... And so finally I went over and I said, ma'am, and she turns around and she's ugly crying. You know what I mean? She's like makeup running, snot going. She's ugly crying. I said, my name is Andrew. And I said, I'm a, I'm a pastor, not a good one, but I'm supposed to pray with you. Would that be okay? And before I know it, she's got her arms around me and she's sobbing. And she begins to tell me the story about how she just came from her husband's bedside and he had had a major stroke and things were not looking good. She was going home to tell her kids and she didn't know what she was going to do. And I said, I don't know what to say, but I'll pray for you. And so I prayed and I prayed and I said, God, I, I don't know what to say, don't know what to do, don't even know this lady's name. <laughs> But God, you know every aspect of it. And so God, I, I, I'm just going to trust that you know best. Said amen. She looked at me, she said, thanks for stopping me. She said, I don't know what I'm going to say. And, and, and it, it still really hurts. But I know that I'm not alone. When I go and talk to my kids, God's going with me. And I made a commitment that day that when I see somebody crying, I would not argue anymore. And I can't tell you the number of times that I have stopped people and that the kids and Jen have been with me and they have walked on because they know dad's got to just go do that because they're crying and I need to just go pray with them. And I will tell you that I have never once Never once in all the times that I've done that had somebody come up to me and say, what you just did fixed everything. What you just did made it not hurt. What you just did made it completely okay. What you just did took away every heartache, every pain, every sadness. I've never once had somebody say that to me. Just once, I'd love that, right? 
I'd love that, to have that, where all of a sudden they just burst into hallelujah chorus. Never had that happen. But I will tell you that I've had more opportunity to share Jesus through the tears of someone that I didn't know than I have many, many times that I've stood in this pulpit. Because it's in that moment that people are ready to hear it. It's in that moment that people are longing for truth to hang on to. Here's this master who prepares this feast. These people have the opportunity to go and participate in it. They have the opportunity to be a part of it. They have the opportunity to see and to eat and to fellowship and to dwell with the master. And they come up with all of these excuses. So the servant goes back. If you look then at verse 20, 21, excuse me, servant goes back and it says he reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town. Bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there's still room. And then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house would be full. I will tell you this, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Who is it that Jesus says that we're supposed to go and talk to? Who is it? When the master prepares this banquet, the people that are invited, the ones that should want to connect, the man who has means enough to buy a field, the man who has means enough to buy five teams of oxen, the man who has just gotten married, the man who should be celebrating, all of them, they were invited initially and they came up with reasons and said, I don't need to. And so the master says, good, fine, don't come. That leaves room for the folk that need to be there. The sick, the poor, the hurting, the hopeless. Can I tell you something? We are surrounded. We are surrounded by the sick and the poor and the hurting and the hopeless. Oh, they may be trying to find their hope in other things. They may define themselves differently. They may say this or that about themselves. They may say, I found happiness here or here. But the reality is you look in their eyes and you know the difference. You know the difference. I'm here to tell you that there's hope for that. There's hope for that because the master has said, my table's already set, bring them in. This is going to blow the doors off the guys that are sitting there at the table because they're all prim and proper. They would not bring the sick, the tired, the lame, the country people. <laughs> I love that we're mentioned specifically, don't you? I love that. You know why that we weren't there at first? Because barbecue was no good. <laughs> Jesus says, my table is set for them. Can I tell you something? There is not one single person in our world today that is beyond the hope of Jesus Christ because there is a place setting for them where the master desires to have fellowship with them. I don't care who they are. I don't care how far gone they are. I don't care what they define themselves as. I don't care what culture says they are. I don't care if they have looked God in the face and said, no, there is still a place at the table for them. And the master desires for you and I to go and share that with them. Can I tell you something? Church has changed. Church has changed. Church today is not the church that I grew up in. It's just different now. Some things I like, some things I don't like, but it's different. But Jesus is the same. The same table is set for those who will come and feast with the master. You know what? That doesn't require them to have put on their proper uniform to come and sit at the table. How many of the people that the master sent the servant out to do, how many of them do you think... How many of them do you think were dressed the way that the master would have planned for them to be at his party? How many of them smelled nice? How many of them had time to polish their shoes? How many of them had time to 
get a fresh shave? How many? I'd say probably not many. And, and the master goes even further to say, great, that you've, you've compelled all those to come in. Let's go the next level and the next level and the next level. And as we do that, let's share Jesus. You know, we are all called to share Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, you're called to share Jesus. You say, well, Andrew, I, I don't know how to put together a sermon, and I don't know what to do. I don't know what the right words are to say. I don't know. That's fine. You don't have to. You know how we share Jesus? We care for each other. We love each other. We encourage one another. We spend a lot less time pointing out all the wrong and a lot more time pointing out the fact that we are image bearers of Jesus and he desires a relationship with us. It's God's job to take care of the wrong. It's God's job. Can you imagine with me that you go to the doctor because you got something going on, you don't know what it is, and you walk up and the receptionist that's there, that's behind the window, you know, the one that has the power of the clipboard, they see you standing there and they say, what you need to do is this. You need to go home. You need to drink a gallon of honey a day. Uh, you need to take an Epsom salts bath and uh, and then you need to get one of those what do they call them? neti pots the things you dump water through your brain and out your nose and if you'll do that you'll be fine and you look at her and you say isn't this the podiatrist's office and she says well yeah well, how come, how come we, I, I want to see the doctor. I, I want to see the nurse. I want to, I, I want, what, what exactly are your qualifications? Oh, I'm here with the temp agency. But I tell you what, I used to work at a butchering shop and we saw people come in all the time look like you. I think, I think this will fix you. How many of you would say, Save me a copay. I'm going home. No. No. You see, we want to talk to the ones who have experience. We want to talk to the ones who have personal knowledge of what's going on. Do you know that the world around us today is not dying to talk to a preacher? What they're dying to talk to is somebody who has walked with Jesus even in difficult times. Who has walked with Jesus through a diagnosis. Who has walked with Jesus through a divorce. Who has walked with Jesus through difficulty. Who has walked through Jesus with difficult kids. Who has walked with Jesus in the midst of financial hardship. Who has walked with Jesus through difficulties and mental anguishes. Who has walked with Jesus in tough times. The world wants to hear from us. They don't want to hear from me as a preacher. They want to hear from us as followers of Jesus who can say, you know what? I've sat at the master's table. It is an amazing thing. And you are welcome there because you're welcome. You know why I know you're welcome? Because he welcomed me. Why is it the Apostle Paul is constantly telling us that he's the chief of sinners, that he struggles day in and day out, that he has a thorn in the flesh? It's because we can identify with that. How easy would it be to listen to Paul who said, I have learned to be content with much and with little if the Apostle Paul lived in Caesar's palace his entire life. It's impossible. You can't relate. Is anybody else tired of hearing how we're all in this together? I'm sick of that. I'm sick of that when... Jobs haven't been lost from the person saying that. I'm sick of that when they haven't had family members who have gotten sick. I'm sick of that when they haven't 
been through the struggle and the angst of should I or shouldn't I? What do I believe? What don't I believe? Man, there's all kinds of stuff. Yes, we are experiencing a similar thing. But folks, we're going through it differently. And so to have somebody stand up and say, hey, you can do this now. Come on. I get a little fired up about Israel and, and the reality of it. You say, why? Here's why. A friend of mine posted a picture this week, and, and it's a legit picture. It came from a, a solid website who has real credibility of a mom with 14 kids sitting in a stairwell while rockets from Gaza rained down in their neighborhood. Can you imagine? These are not all her children, obviously. But some of them there she has taken the responsibility of raising because their moms have been killed in the previous rocket attacks. Come on. And then we have somebody who simply because they want a popularity contest gets up and says, well, they don't need to worry about that. They don't need to, you know, I mean, it's not that big a deal. They just need to sit down and be quiet. Come on. Come on. People want to hear from us because they want to know that we've experienced the grace of Jesus. People don't want to hear that we think that they're wrong. The Bible clearly defines that. Right and wrong is clearly defined in Scripture. I don't have to stand up here every week and say, hey, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. The Bible does that. As followers of Jesus, we should be in this finding that out. What I have to do is stand up here and compel us and encourage us, you and me, that when we see our neighbor out, we walk over and in kindness, we speak with them so that we may earn the opportunity to share with them Jesus. That when we see a brother or sister struggling, we look at them and we say, I got your back. Listen, I don't know how this is going to be okay. I don't have the words to make it okay, but I want you to know that come hell or high water, I got you. Because we are surrounded by people who are struggling with that. And maybe you're here today and you're struggling with that. And I want you to know there is a place at the table. You bring your baggage, you bring your junk, you bring your garbage, you bring your past, you bring your pain, you bring your doubts, you bring it all. Because you know what? I'm sitting there with you and I got all that stuff. I got all of it. And yet Jesus said, have a seat. Have a seat. I know where you've been. I know what you're going through. I know what's on your mind. Have a seat. You're welcome at my table. Oh, I know you want to call wrong right. Oh, I know that you think you're okay. Sit down here and let me show you the truth. I'm not going to smack you with it. I'm just going to share it with you while I pass the gravy. I've shared with you many times about my grandmother. One of the godliest women I've ever met in my life and that I probably will ever meet this side of eternity. She pulled no punches. None. If I had to hear one more time in my lifetime that I was on the slicky slide to hell because that was one of her famous phrases. You keep doing that, that's a slicky slide to hell. You do that, that's a slicky slide to hell. She would say those things. She would call it out. She would, on the money. But you know what? She never once did it that she didn't make me real first. Never once. If you walked into my grandmother's house, it didn't matter if you just came from a restaurant and had to put on sweatpants because you were so full. 
she would say, sit down, let me get you a bite. Let me get you a bite. Now to her, a bite meant three courses plus dessert. And you'd say, oh, I, I, can't, I could sit down, let me get you a bite. Andy Rufus, that's what they called me. Sit down, you're going to get a bite. And one would sit down at the table. And I would look at the table and I would see the chicken napkin holder and the little box of Bible verses that were all worn and dog eared because she read them every single morning. And I would see the placemat that she had over the tablecloth and then she'd put down a paper towel because she didn't want to get the placemat dirty that was to protect the tablecloth. And then the food would start coming out. And she'd set it down and she'd set it down and she'd set it down. And then she'd sit down with me and she would reach her hand over. And she'd pray with me. She'd say, now eat. And as soon as my mouth was full, she'd start preaching. <laughs> but it was never, it was never condemning. It was never. She walked with me at her table. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is the message of hope. We are welcome at the table. Oh, let me tell you something. At the table, I've spent plenty of time under correction. But I was always loved. Always. And there were times I got up from the table and left and thought, I ain't never doing that again. Until the next time. And there were times at the table that I knew she was right. And I'd have to look her in the eye and I would say, you're right. But I was always welcome. The master says, the table is ready. Go get them. Go get them. They need to know. Let's pray together. God, today, I'm grateful for the, uh, the privilege to share your word. I'm thankful that you welcome us to the table. With all of our garbage and all of our stuff, God, forgive me for the times that I have. I've looked at someone and thought, you don't want them at the table. <laughs> because you do. Help us to be a church. You know what? Forget that. Help us to be a community that shares that truth. That you're welcome at the table because the Master loves you. And I know that because he loves me. God, may that be the May that be the holy water that cleanses the pain of the world that we walk in. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team is going to lead us. Would you stand? <laughs>
forgiveness. Whatever your excuse is to not sit at the table, stop it. That's the most loving thing I can tell you. Come to the table. There's a spot for you. There's a spot for your kids. There's a spot for your neighbor, for your co-worker, for that person that you think, man, there ain't no chance. There's already a place set. We just got to trust it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Help us to be obedient to it. Help me to be obedient to it. Give me an opportunity this week to speak life and to share an invitation to the table. We'll give you the praise for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. If you're on the administrative board, we do have a board meeting following church today. Otherwise, you are dismissed. Thanks for being here. Thank you.